Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is the author of a wonderful book about a dystopian sci-fi about young adults that is gaining lots of praise and international recognition. This particular story is set in the future where books are a distant memory. Written word has been replaced by an ever-present stream of images known as verity. In the controlling dominion of the United Veils of Fail, reading is obsolete. Images in the stream are discovered where teenager Noelle Hartley sees words, and not just the images alone. She's obsessed with what they mean, where they came from, and why they found her. Noelle's been keeping her dangerous fixation with words a secret, but on the night before her 17th birthday, a rare interruption in the stream known as Verity leads her to a mysterious volume linked to an underworld of rebel book lovers known as the Nine of the Rising. She's joining us here on the program today to talk about her newest book, Blood, Ink, and Fire, and I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Ashley Mansour. Ashley, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Thank you for having me. Boy, the written word. Isn't that just a lovely thing? Oh, it is. It really is. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us uh, how you got started in all of this. Um, Well, I've been a writer for many years, and um, I was working on screenplays, writing for TV and film. And um, I've had this novel that I'd sort of been toiling away with and and, uh, writing and rewriting and Finally, it got to this uh, stage where I thought it was ready, and I uh, was working with Alex Pettifer at the time with his production company, so I thought, you know, I've got a sense of the kind of stories that he likes, and I thought I'd send it his way, and, you know, fingers and toes crossed, and he read it, um, and he came back to me, and he said, you know, I really I really like this, this book, this story, the love story in it, and uh, the way it's relevant to the world today. Um, so he he uh, he decided to publish it. You know, we had some discussions about it, and he said, you know, who's going to publish this book? And I said, well, no one yet. Hopefully, hopefully, you'll be the one to publish it. So, yeah, it was really exciting to kind of um, the the first novel that I'd written get out in this way, in this really kind of big way. It's exciting. Now, was this something I understand a couple of years back that you had to overcome your fear of social media and you set up an Instagram uh, account? What was the fear with the social media for you? Oh, yeah. So that was interesting because I'd always kind of um, feared sort of putting myself out there on social media, chronicling, you know, daily life and the way that um, social media is very sort of intrusive and the way it kind of cast this eye on, on different people and, 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 and who they are. So I sort of, you know, very been, been, been very hesitant to kind of um, put myself out there in that way. Um, and so it was very freeing to start um, sharing um, my writing journey and discovering that there are people on social media that did what I did and that enjoyed the type of books that I enjoyed and had the same hobbies. Um, and so putting myself out there, it, it actually became a very freeing process and an exciting process because it's this instant feedback loop. You know, you sort of put yourself out there and people respond and they react and they engage and it's really kind of addictive and fun. Um, and so that's how I kind of found myself and my audience uh, through Instagram. Now, I understand that your um, publisher is actually uh, founded by a gentleman, uh, uh, Alex Pettifer, from what I understand, and he was b- involved with the Alex Writer series, if I understand. He, it, yeah, that's right. That's right. He acted in uh, the Stormbreaker uh, film, and, um, yeah, he, he's done a lot of uh, Hollywood films as well um, as an adult, um, Magic Mike and... So he founded Upturn Publishing, which um, is a sort of a branch of Upturn Productions, his film and TV company that I was writing for. Um, And Upturn Publishing is the publisher of Blood, Ink, and Fire. So, yeah, it's really exciting. Now, it's interesting because I got into this book, uh, Blood, Ink, and Fire, and uh, I I kept finding myself, I, I, I take public transportation when I go downtown, and it's astounding how often you find people don't really talk to each other anymore. 
They've got their cell phones as though they were born, you know, embedded into their hands, and they seem to be <laughs> wasting a lot of time on nonsense. And it's funny when it comes to social media. I have a Facebook account, and of course, you know, that's kind of where we put a lot of our interviews like today and so forth and so on. I don't interact on Facebook very much because, you know, outside of the fact that it's kind of neat that I found some key people that I knew back when I was in high school, this, that, and the other, you know, again, I don't really interact on it too much because it's sort of like people are going there for some sort of pseudo-attention that they weren't getting somehow in their lives. What are your thoughts about <laughs> something like that? Because I look at this going, you know, oh, hey, today I had my first piece of cheesecake at wherever. And <laughs> then you get the stream of people, ooh, ah, nice. And I'm like, Jesus, this is ridiculous. <laughs> but that's just my opinion. No, I think, it's, I think it's true. It's very valid because, you know, there's this, like, there's a plethora of just, you know, kind of, bizarre um, day-to-day posts on social media. And there, I think there's a danger of kind of drowning in that, in, in this kind of irrelevant information that doesn't really help us or it doesn't really move us forward. And yet we're obsessed with it. We can't really get enough of it. And I think that's what Verity um, sort of represents in the book is this obsession with, uh, with, with those sort of bland, you know, uninformative, useless posts. They're, they're just, they're, they're sort of nothing. And, then, and yet they're everything. They consume our time. They consume our days now, which is really quite frightening when you think about what's going on in the world. And we're sucked into these virtual worlds, like you're saying, Facebook or Instagram, or, you know, there has to be a balance. And I find that whole kind of tension there really fascinating and very intriguing. <laughs> Well, there's no doubt about that. It was uh, just a few months back, we, uh, my wife and I had attended a Lorena McKennett concert. And for those who may not be familiar, she is somebody who does the old Celtic stories. You know, she really travels the world to really gather, you know, the history of the Celts, who they were, and then, you know, her, her, her music is just phenomenal. And she was talking about how technology is beginning to grip, you know, our children especially. I mean, when you're starting to see kids playing with cellular phones at the age of two years old, that parents are allowing their children at the age of five to have these contraptions. You know, it wasn't like when I grew up where there was one telephone in the house and you got some time on it until the parents went to bed and maybe, you know, like my brother could lay on the couch all night long, you know, just listening to his girlfriend breathing on the other end of the phone for hours on end. But... The fact was is that you didn't have that instant access like you do now. And, and she was saying it's disturbing because technology today seems to be, you know, and I'm just stretching this, again, it's just an opinion, rewiring the way our children think and believe in, for instance, rewards and punishments, so to speak. You know, because with the cell phone, you have those games or you have social media, for instance, and you get that instant gratification, and that changes the way I think a young child thinks. And that's quite a bit what Verity is doing here in your novel as well, and that's why I kind of looked at this like, how did you begin thinking about this novel? It couldn't have been just the social media experiment that you were doing, but beyond that, what came to you where you thought, you know, this is something that really needs to be written about? Um, it's interesting because, you know, I, I'd been contemplating this idea for a long time, and I think probably the seed for the book was planted when I was in graduate school, and I uh, volunteered to kind of do some book restoration, some old book restoration in this archive, and it was underground, and it was freezing cold. You had to put on these, you know, huge jackets just to bear the temperatures down there, and, and all of that, of course, was, you know, to preserve these rare books, these, these pieces of, of, you know, human history. And um, we would go down there and, and clean for hours and hours, sort of scrubbing the soot off the pages one by one. It was a very um, difficult task, and it took a long time to, to do and complete one actual book. And um, so that sort of got me thinking, because that was right around the time that the first iPhones were coming out, and um, everything was really starting to move very quickly um, with social media and our access, and books were being digitized. And, and so that whole process really started me thinking about 
we know the way society is on this very interesting tra trajectory. Um, on the one hand, we're, we're consumed by digital media and social media and these sort of like virtual experiences that mirror real experiences. Um, like look at Pokemon Go, for instance. You have thousands of people that are suddenly interacting differently in the day-to-day -day world because of something that's taking place in the digital world. And then on the other hand, we have this history of physical you know, analog technologies, the book perhaps being among the first. And so that's the question I wanted to ask in Blood, Ink, and Fire is, is, is there a danger of these being erased? And then what would happen to human beings if that written word was erased from us? You know, what would a society without books actually look like? Now, one thing I can certainly agree with you uh, as you uh, read Blood, Ink, and Fire is that you talk about how books, you know, they help us develop a very strong imagination. And I remember as I was growing up, um, I had, like a lot of young boys, an interest in dinosaurs. And it was interesting because I could remember going as far back as, you know, preschool in the first grade. And my mother, she didn't really finish high school because that's, she had to have me. But, you know, she taught me to read, but she had me pursue the reading in a way of things I was interested in, and mine was dinosaurs. And, you know, she was saying it was interesting to teach you to read because at first I was teaching you how to read some of these words, you know, the names of the dinosaurs, for instance, that were pretty complicated, but then pretty soon I was teaching her. <laughs> you know, it's amazing the capacity children have for being able to pick up a book, learning to read, and then being able to really excel at it. And so the fact was, as I started, you know, if I was the kind of kid with the light, you know, the flashlight under the blanket, you know, reading the book when everybody was asleep, and it was interesting because the books started getting bigger and thicker. <laughs> you know, there were less pictures, actually. And, you know, and, and again, you know, I would imagine what would it be like to be in a world like that? And it seems today that some of that is being taken away because it's sort of as though the imagination is being created for you. And I, I don't find that very comforting in knowing that that's going on. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the idea that, you know, now our imaginations are sort of created for us because everything is, is there visually for us to see and, you know, we're bombarded constantly by the visual. So, you know, yeah, there's, there's less of that space in the interior for us to kind of go, okay, well, what would this world look like or, you know, what would this place and time be like? And I think, I think that's true. I mean, definitely as a kid, I used to live inside my imagination and, you know, kind of go to these different places um, and that, there is a lot less of that, I think, today because it, everything, as you were saying, it's just so instant. And, um, yeah, there's, there's a, a real fear associated with that, which I think is why I definitely stayed off social media for such a long time because it is all-consuming. And um, you kind of have to draw a line and go and, and kind of say, all right, this is enough social media for today. I'm going to go back to the page, you know, go back to the actual printed word. Because um, it's such a different experience when you open a book versus when you turn on your kin your Kindle or your iPad. You know, it's really it really is different. Um, and I think hopefully we don't lose that that love of the printed word of the actual book because it's it's a brilliant piece of technology. You know, the idea that you can carry a story around with you. No doubt about that. Now, you know, I'm sure that as you've been out and you've been answering questions about your novel, that you've heard probably comparisons to Fahrenheit 451, you know, obviously a novel about burning books and getting rid of them. Uh, but, you know, I can see how this is a lot different. Share the differences, do you think, because I don't see a, a whole lot of similarities in this particular one. Yeah, I think the, the primary... Um, similarity is the idea that, you know, this is a world that does not appreciate books, that does not allow books and readers, and it's a, you know, it's a dystopian future that does not want the written word to persist. And, um, and, and so that's really the core similarity. But apart from that, everything is really different. In Blood, Ink, and Fire, you have uh, the world of Fell and, um, the world of the nine sovereigns outside of cell, which is vastly different. And that's sort of, you know, that's sort of the last hope for the, the books and the written word, the idea that they could have a life beyond um, cell. So there's a little bit more of a hopeful 
uh, perhaps a hopeful tone to the novel where, you know, the, the entire sort of arc of the story is around the idea that we can save the books, that the future doesn't have to be this world where books are destroyed and systematically eliminated by this, this government presence. So, yeah, I think there's, there's a nice hopeful tone there. Um, and hopefully in book two we'll see some of that explored um, in a more, uh, you know, precise way. Now tell us a little bit about book two before we go back to, to the first book, because uh, there was a question I had concerning blindness, especially with one of the characters, John. But tell us about the, the, the follow-up book or the second book that you're coming up with. Yeah, so book two sort of takes place um, where uh, the first book leaves off. We've got this time lapse of Noelle. She's been inside, trapped inside cell for over 100 days now. And so it, it picks up with her held captive. Um, in the capital, and she's sort of having to face a lot of her demons, you know, the death of her parents, her best friend, um, the decision that she's made, which has led her um, to be held captive, um, and grappling with all those demons um, internally um, and through the processes that Fell is subjecting her to now that she's a prisoner there. Um, so it, it, it starts in that kind of sense, and we get a snapshot of exactly what's gone on over the past hundred days since she's been taken um, on the outside. So what the sovereigns have been up to, uh, how Ledger's faring in the winnow, and you know what's going on with Pedanta, the fact that Cell has invaded them. So we get, we get that catch up, um, but in a very unique way. So the book will have more than one point of view, just like the first novel. Uh, interesting. I know that uh, now you talk about word blindness, and this is something that the stream Verity actually begins to do is rewire people uh, neurologically so that that way they can no longer see or read words. And they uh, also do this through a process known as immersion. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I became fascinated by this idea that you know we could sort of undo the neural the neurocircuitry of being able to read, undo that wiring. Um, so whatever happens when we learn to read, is there a way that we can block that? And it was, you know, in that process I found that, you know, it's actually a real condition where people are unable to recognize the written word. Readers, people that have been able to read their entire lives, suddenly losing that capacity, um, unfortunately, through a, a stroke. Um, and... Um, so in the novel, you know, I thought, I began to ask myself what would happen if this power, this government, started inflicting people with this condition um, on a deliberate basis. You know, what if the strokes were deliberate? What if that was the way that they went about their, their brainwashing, you know, and their reprogramming of these people? And it's a really frightening thought, the idea that one day you can be completely literate and can read and write, and the next day, that ability is stolen from you. And so everything Cell does is based around um, everything that they do in the veil, in Noel's veil, is in order to um, exact immersion on, on their citizens and uh, control them, basically. Now, one thing that is uh, mentioned as well uh, that I really enjoyed, I think, is that there is a fear of people reading books. <laughs> and it's so true because this day and age it seems people just kind of spread around what you would call secondhand information that are would tend to be from sources that, well, they're barely reliable at best. You know, there's sound bites, things like that, and then basically it's left up to the interpretation of the receiver to share that with someone else, and before you know it, you've got a totally different story. And we commonly have guests here on the program that say, you know, look, you know, I, I know I'm speaking as an expert from this direction, but what you need to do as the listener is you need to have the responsibility to get up and find these things out for yourself. In other words, do your homework. And that's something that a lot of people are just not willing to do anymore. What do you think it is that kind of made us lazy? You can't just totally point the finger and say it's all technology. I think it's that, it's that process of um, being active versus being passive. You know, when you when you kind of... When you read something, you're asked to, to be active, and it's quite a lot of effort to read a book if you think about it. Um, it, it's, it requires you to really critically think about 
the words and the story and the characters, and you actually have to decide uh, in your mind, do I like this story? What does it mean? What are they trying to say? What should I take from it? And that's a really active process, I think. But then on the other hand, you have, um, you have sort of like we talked about digital media, and that's a very passive process because it's like you're sort of being fed and like you were saying, these bite-sized snippets of these sound bites and information, and they've been sort of distilled down to like these dige digestible little pieces. And we're used to sort of just snacking on that content. You know, it becomes a very, you know, snackable situation where you just pick up bits and pieces where you like, but without really having to critically process or think about what they mean in a bigger, in a bigger respect. And so I think that's a very kind of a detrimental process. If you're not really digesting a larger work and kind of thinking about what it means in a bigger context, you get lost in the, in the snacking. You know, you could snack for hours but never really take anything in. And I think that's kind of what Verity does in this novel. She just feeds you constantly, and yet you're never really full. You're never really satisfied um, by what you're receiving. And that probably is a danger of you know what we face today is that, that lack of uh, that lack of active thinking when you're consuming the media. Now, uh, one of the interesting things to note too about this, uh, you talk about how you know you're constantly snacking. You've got this voracious appetite, but yet you kind of pretty much feel empty inside. But you know, you're so right about, you know, when it comes to reading and taking in and digesting a book, whether it's a novel or it's a work of fiction, nonfiction, whatever the case is. And I know that one of your favorite authors is Shakespeare, that you actually studied Shakespeare, uh, and that that happened to be the gift that Noel received uh, from a grandmother by the name of Miriam. And that sort of felt like a dangerous endeavor when it came to Miriam's son, uh, you know, says, hey, you know, what are you doing here? You know, this is going to disrupt a whole lot of things. Yes, yes, that, that scene where, where Hale is kind of, he's asking his mother, he's like, you know, what have you done? You've given her Shakespeare, which is, which is our secret. You know, it's the one thing we have left. Um, and Shakespeare is like, he's absolutely fascinating to me. Um, most of us, we first encounter Shakespeare in high school, and we're given this copy of Romeo and Juliet and forced to muddle through this form of literature and language and we're totally unfamiliar with it. And, you know, usually without any background or understanding of the time and place in which Shakespeare was creating these works, we're asked to actually understand it. Um, but in many ways that, that education is like absolutely failing us because teachers don't start with exactly how it happens that we're even able to hold these works of Shakespeare, how they've come to us through, you know, the, the, the many centuries, um, how we're even able to read his work so is a miracle, um, and it's an inconceivable process um, by which the plays were transcribed and retranscribed and then painstakingly printed. Um, so, yeah, it's a miracle that we're able to hold these, these books of his works now. And I think to understand that process is really then to appreciate the history of books and be able to read them. So yeah, Shakespeare is absolutely fascinating. I I adore him. <laughs> yeah, there's a uh, fascinating movie out there that's about uh, Shakespeare and questioning whether or not Shakespeare actually wrote what he's been attributed to. And uh, you know, and uh, uh, I can't remember the title of the movie right now, but you know, in this afterwards in the extras. They talk with these scholars and they say, okay, well, let's take a look at where Shakespeare lived, who he was, what was his life about, and now let's take a look at these things that he was acclaimed to have written. Well, the kind of person that had written the works that Shakespeare gets credit for would have to be, for instance, part of royalty. He had had to be able to travel you know, across Europe and so forth, so he's well-traveled with the aristocracy. You know, and you take a look at all these elements that go into what makes a Shakespearean, you know, book what it is, is, you know, all these interesting elements. And I was reminded as, as we were talking here about uh, anthropologist Wade Davis, uh, who uh, I've talked to a couple of times. And uh, one of the books that he put out there was uh, the, the uh, last, uh, the, oh, Light at the Edge of the World, I'm sorry. And for a lot of people, they think, well, what does that mean? Well, that's actually how the Amazonian natives see their forest. They're starting to see what's called the edge of the world, which is the edge of the forest. 
And you're talking about people who have never left the Amazon rainforest. They don't even know what the world outside of that place is, but now because of the decimated forest, they're seeing that edge get closer and closer, hence the edge of the world. What he was also talking about in this book is just imagine that you are the last person on earth that speaks the language that you speak. Now, when you see what you're writing here and what's going on with technology, you realize just losing a book, that's devastating enough, but you're also losing a language. You know, you're losing a society. You're losing a way of life, tradition. You know, we lived in a world at one time where we had oratory as a way of passing on traditional stories and so forth and so on, and we just don't have, it's all mixed and broken up to where we really don't even know where the sources came from anymore. And you can almost, you can definitely see the inherent danger in something like that, hence the dystopian teenage world that we tend to see a lot in movies and that's written about here in your book, Blood, Ink, and Fire. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's very interesting to, to hear from readers um, when they react to the end of the novel. A lot of them kind of email me with these very impassioned <laughs> messages, and they're, they're really actually emotionally reacting to that ending, and they kind of say, you know, What's going on with this? You know, why did Noelle do what she, what she did? Um, and, you know, why have you put us through this task of reading this 400-and-something page book and to not even know what happens? You know, it's just lost, et cetera. Um, and so they're used to being fed, you know, probably stories that are more concise and have that nice little beginning, nice little tie-up at the end, and that's just not this book. Um, and it's also not real life, you know. That's also not the world that we live in and the way that things are. Now, uh, Ashley, are you trying happen. to tell us it's, it's not a happily ever after? <laughs> I was just watching a documentary on Walt Disney, and I realized, you know, this is the guy that laid the happily ever after trip on all of us when it came to love. <laughs> I wish. I mean, I think there are there is room for happily ever after, but, you know, a lot of times we have to work for that happily ever after and make it for ourselves, so... Yeah, the book takes a different approach, I think. And a lot of readers were really surprised when it didn't end the way that they thought it would. That's the way great stories are. I think it was known as irony as we were learning that in school when it came to literature, wasn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. Well, this has been exciting to have you on the program. I'm looking forward to finishing the book here. You know, uh, there's a lot to go uh, in it, but I've really enjoyed what I've read so far. And I was wondering... Is there a website people can find out more about how to get the book, get in touch with you? Um, I see that on Twitter you're on there as well, and uh, so there's a lot of places people can find you pretty easily. Yeah, absolutely. You can go to bloodinkfire.com. That's the website for the book. Um, You'll find lots of ways to connect and join up there. Uh, We also have the official online store that's launching on that website uh, later this month, so that's exciting for people who are interested in getting some swag, official merchandise, and, of course, the signed book copies, uh, which will be autographed by myself and Alex Pettifer. So that's really cool for his fans. Um, So, yeah, they can do that. Or my website is ashleymansour.com as well, so if you can connect with me there too. Very good. And I just have one more final thought. I know this was shared to me by the producer, but is there a possibility they're looking to make this into a film? Uh, yeah, I think definitely Upturn Productions is, they've acquired the, the film and TV rights, so um, they're definitely looking to get it out into the world on the screen. Um, what size that screen is, we'll have to wait and see, but hopefully it's the big screen. <laughs> a very big screen for sure. Well, Ashley, I <laughs> yeah. want to thank you for the, taking the time out to join us here on the program and share your buck, blood, ink, and fire. I knew this was going to be an enjoyable conversation. I'm following you back on Twitter as we speak. So now we can keep on going what's going on there and that that sort of a thing. But it's been a real pleasure to have you here on the program. Thank you for joining us here today. Oh, thank you so much. It's been such an honor. I really appreciate it. Will do, and I'll look forward to your second novel after this one. (laughs) Thank you so much, Daniel. I appreciate it. Thank you. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us. You can also discover more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com, the number 50. Sign up for our weekly e-newsletter so you can stay up to date on what's coming up on the Beyond 50 radio program and get involved as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.